right, here is our third lesson, Unit 1. There is some secession going to happen in 1860. Two essential questions for you. Put them down the left-hand side, divide them up, one at the very top, one in the middle. Make sure before you read this, I would like for you to go ahead and underneath the second essential question, restate those questions, answer on the back of your outline notes, the questions from the Declaration of Independence, just paragraph A, the first paragraph. It's important to understand the rationale for secession. You're going to want to know that. Election of 1860, our issue of slavery has been talking for a while here as splitting the been splitting the Democratic Party. Our Northern Democrat is going to be Stephen Douglas, Mr. Popular Sovereignty Man from Illinois, and the Southern Democrat, John C. Breckinridge, vowing to uphold slavery. A fourth party is going to be here on top of the Republicans, getting to that next, the Constitutional Party, Constitution Union Party, led by John Bell, supporting federal Support for the Union and slavery, still trying to have your cake and eat it too. It's not going to work, but all these parties are going to divide the election up, but it's not going to make any difference because our Mr. Lincoln here and these platforms that you see here, you can use this to modify or go ahead and summarize their views on slavery here on the left-hand side. Our Mr. Abraham Lincoln is going to win anyway, pretty much outright. But it's important to know and review, and this is important for future units, very important for future and understanding the Republican Party for the decades to come. What are they running on? Well, number one for this unit, for this test, any assessment in this time period, you got to know again, it's about keeping slavery right where it is. Getting rid of it is unrealistic. It would disrupt the entire economy and society. That's an abolitionist mindset, but it's not the official Republican Party mindset. To talk about slavery being abolished, it would immediately cause a breakup of the union. And that's not what Lincoln or Republican Party wants to have happen. The election of 1860's second point for the Republican Party is a protective tariff. Just like the Whigs and the Federalists before them, they want a tax on foreign goods, keep those goods more expensive, less likely for Americans to buy them, and they use that money to do a few things. We'll talk about that in a second. Industry, business likes that, the consumer not so much. Number three, no limit on the rights of immigrants or the in influence or infl influx of immigrants into the country. And this is something industry wants. They want lots of cheap labor. However, there is a political party, the Know Nothings again, and that party's kind of faded away and fell apart here now. They're not so thrilled about it, the nativists. They want to keep America more Protestant and pure, for lack of a better term. Uh, but this is part of the Republican Party platform to feed the need for workers and supply industry with labor. The fourth point, this is where the tariff comes in and gets applied, government aid or subsidies to railroads to help build uh, and build railroads into the West and connect the West. This is going to create jobs. It's going to grow the economy. This is going to be the backbone of our second industrial revolution that's going to be spurred because of this war and our Pacific Railway Act under Lincoln is going to be passed. And number five, internal improvements. This again is where the tariff comes in. Industry likes this as well. That is to build roads, build canals, and the railroads are part of those in internal improvements. Uh, remember that this is one of those things that Henry Clay talked about that was part of your summer assignment that needs to be done to connect the country because so, it's so large, bind the country together with these things. But the tariff and that whole issue is a issue between North and South that has long divided them and almost brought the country into secession in the 1830s, right? But this is what the Republican Party is all about. And of course, Southerners don't like that. So they don't like slavery, but they don't like some of these things either because it means the federal government is going to take on more power and control. This sounds like old things from years past. Free homesteads for the public domain for farmers, fill up the West, the big space that's out there, cheap land, and that will turn into farms and fuel the economy and feed the hungry mouths back in the east as well. This will happen with the Homestead Act of 1860. But the number one thing for this unit, again, is that number one. Make sure you remember and know that. The results, it is very clear north of the Ohio River, north of the Mason-Dixon line right here at the line of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Lincoln gets all the states in the north. Republican red and the two states that are out in the east. Oregon has been added by this point in time as well. Southerners really felt that a victory here would result in uh, slave revolts all across the country because of their speak about slavery, keeping it where it is. It didn't happen that way. Uh, the Democrats were divided, and Lincoln wins a clear majority of electoral vo uh, college votes in all of this. And Mr. Popular Sovereignty uh, Man wins one southern state. Lincoln wins his home state of, of Illinois. Purely sectional vote in all this. Again, our parties are parties of 
regions of the country, sections, uh, not even on the southern ballot. Lincoln, his name didn't appear on any of them. And so uh, for obvious reasons, he wins every northern state and states start talking of secession. They were talking of secession before his election. Uh, now they are going to really secede. And that's where it really begins. But there is efforts to try and compromise before the secession happens. The legislatures in the South are getting together. They're talking about it. Republicans, again, are promising not to disturb slavery. Uh, however, they distrust the Republicans' willingness to protect their rights. And again, as we talked about before, if you keep slavery where it is, eventually the West fills up with free states and the South does not have any power in Congress at all in representation. December 20th, 1860, South Carolina seceded, secedes from the Union. Uh, other dates are also debating secession. Uh, it is important to know that South Carolina is the first. Definitely know that. Constitutional amendments in a compromise are proposed, about six of them. See your Quizlet for the other key points when you do your left side snap chart. The most important one, though, is that they want to try and protect that slavery interest again and bring back the 3630 line and just extend it out and I guess maybe split California out there, right? This was one of the key points. That's the main one you really have to, to know. Uh, there are about five others. Look to your Quizlet set for the other five. What do the Republicans think about this? Well, the Republicans getting petitioned and pushed to do something to keep the come up with a compromise to keep the union together because South Carolina is seceding and we want to bring them back in the union. Who else is going to secede? We don't know. Uh, there's a petition trying to shove a compromise pill out of a pillbox. Pills were round, kind of like jawbreakers back in the day. And here we got a Republican with his platform, squeezing that platform, trying to hang on to it while other people are trying to shove it down their throat. And this Republican, Lincoln, is not having it. He said, I just won on the idea of no expansion of slavery. Uh, why should we be breaking up a government unless we surrender to those who we have just beaten? I ran on these ideas, and now I'm going to give in. I would look wimpy. I would look ineffective. I would have no legitimacy. We can't do that. It's just wrong. You'd be lying to the people and going back on our word. The South basically said the same thing. Uh, we spit on every plan to compromise was uh, the comment from one. Uh, no human power can save the Union now from the other. The compromise really had no chance. After the secession of South Carolina comes February 1861. Only about a month or so from the inauguration day in March, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia join to form the Confederacy, like the Articles of Confederation, a loose organization of states that are just together to defend themselves from the oppressor, right? Very structured, much like that. And Jefferson Davis is the president. Very loose president. Mr. Jefferson, Jefferson Davis does not have a lot of power. The states have more of the power, just like they like it. And he's going to find it difficult to wage war under those conditions when it comes to it. This is our level. These are our levels of secession. We've got Deep South, number one. And let's take a look at how that coincides with where the cotton is produced, where the slaves are. Slavery and cotton, slave population, cotton production go hand in hand. The most intense thinking about cotton and slavery is reflected in the secession map, as you saw here down below. Well, what's going to cause the rest of them to secede? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. But how is it that they justify secession? Well, they would then talk about uh, in seceding and justifying secession and these legislatures debating it, argued that our compact, right, the compact theory, Jefferson Madison uh, argues that the 1787 convention with all the states coming together, giving up some power to a more powerful federal government was an agreement. And these states, since they voluntarily joined, understanding that there are shared powers, the federal government can do this, the states are reserved that, 10th Amendment, states' rights, all that kind of thing, that has been broken. The federal government broke this because uh, they have been taking on more power than we initially thought they would. So since we voluntarily chose to get in, we can voluntarily choose to leave. They will also look at the Declaration of Independence. That's why I wanted you to read it and answer, answer and restate those questions on the left-hand side of your notebook. Look at that Declaration of Independence. They are going to use evidence from that also to say this is why they can. So this contract, is, the Constitution is a contract according to them. The national government has violated it, uh, not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, denying southern states equal rights in the territories. 
uh, and thus the states had the right to leave the union. They'll also point to the tariff going way back, long-term, long-term stuff and states' rights involving that. And people will say and argue it's states' rights, but it's slavery that breaks the camel's back and brings us to secession, the right to have slaves out in the Western territory and keep and enforce that existence of slavery. Reactions to secession. Many southern, uh, many southerners welcomed. It. There tended to be parades in the streets, church bells ringing, mom saying, "Yeah, go, Johnny, uh, go serve, fight, fight for your country." Others, though, a few leaders like Robert E. Lee that you see here, who was a veteran of the Mexican-American War and probably considered the most able-bodied uh, soldier to run any army, uh, said that he was very fearful of a calamity here. His plantation, he owned slaves, is present-day Arlington National Cemetery. It's on a hill that looks across the Potomac River right down in Washington, D.C., and when Mr. Lincoln looks for a general, he will write to Lee to be the general, but Lee will refuse and fight for Virginia and the South. In the North, it's more mixed. Abolitionists say they're weird. This society is moral, unjust. It's evil. Let them leave. Others would say, nope, the union must be, pre be preserved. If you let one state just leave because they don't like it anymore, who's to say that another state in the North or any other time is just going to leave whenever they want when they don't like a law or a thing? And then you have no purpose in government at all. And so Lincoln has argued the minority just does not have the right to break up the government whenever they choose. We have elections, majority rule, that's it. And they just have to change it and live with it in a different way. So Lincoln's been elected, but for four months, he's sitting around waiting to be sworn into office. And the president, uh, president at the time, President Buchanan, said the secession is really illegal and he had no power to stop it. And he really didn't do a whole lot to do anything there with that. And this is allowing for the secession to continue to happen. So essentially, he's a president of a country that is torn apart and broken while the lower south seceded. He gets to his inauguration day in Washington, D.C. He had to be kind of smuggled in. Uh, threats of killing his assassination were abound all over the place, but he does get into Washington, D.C. And he spoke directly to the seceding states uh, with a mixture of toughness and peace. He said, uh, secession will not be permitted. The union of these states is perpetual forever. It can't just be broken up whenever. And he vows to hold federal property and forts and military installations in the South, and he will enforce the law of the land. Again, he reinforces also that he's not here to take slavery away. And the last point here, holding federal forts in the South is the key point here that also creates things to go into a really horrible and worse direction. The Confederacy was taking over and controlling a lot of forts. Some of them were in the south, well, all over the south, Florida, all along the Gulf Coast. And one, the one that's in particular comes to a point of contention is a place called Fort Sumter. He wants to control it, but he doesn't want to provoke war. How do you get control of it if you're not really con in control of it or it's surrounded? That kind of thing. The whole fort itself is being uh, is being uh, basically uh, starved out of existence. It's running low on supplies, water, basic things like that. And so what does he do? Does he let it go? Well, he can't let it go because then he's going to look wimpy. Uh, he chooses to basically send unarmed troops with supplies down to Fort Sumter and let the South decide how they're going to respond to it. And the response is President Jefferson Davis says, South Carolina, go ahead and attack the fort. They do. They bomb it to pieces. Miraculously, nobody dies. But this is the beginning of the Civil War. You've got to know that. This is the beginning of the Civil War, the firing on for Fort Sumter. All right. So when this happens, then there is an additional response. All right. Now, with this, Lincoln can say that the North did not fire the first shots. It's the bad boys and girls in the South who fired the first shots. And uh, the North is unified by this. Right. Anybody in the North can say, well, this was wrong and we're siding with uh, Abraham Lincoln. Now he can act as commander in chief with some force to try and suppress the rebellion. So. In order to suppress the rebellion, Lincoln calls for 75,000 troops. He got far more than that volunteering. Uh, they turned those people away. Does so without congressional approval, though. But he's acting on his power as commander-in-chief. Uh, so we don't have necessarily a declaration of war in all this at all. Keep in mind, there is no declaration of war in this. This, this is a civil war. 
right? So he's saying this is a, a rebellion and this is not a legitimate country. You only declare war on legitimate countries. So when he calls up 75,000 troops into the South, then what happens is, okay, first level, Lincoln is elected, secession level number one, South Carolina and everybody else to the left there in the deep South follows, right? Slavery, cotton, intense, right? Can't allow for slavery to stay where it is. The second level here now is going to secede from the Union because of Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for troops to suppress the rebellion, right? And this is where the Confederacy will stand. It's only these states in the dark orange, in the light orange. What's left, slave states here in the border states, you've got to know these. These are incredibly important for us to, to, to know. Uh, these states will have slavery, but they're a mix. Remember I talked to you, a country being kind of like Neapolitan ice cream. You got one flavor in the north, you got another flavor in the south, but in the middle, there's kind of a mix. And this is the mix, and some are union and some are pro-south, and they're not too sure they want to go, and the Lincoln administration and his armies will work hard to hold them and prevent them from going into the south. These are the border states. Make sure you know them. Get your map identification done and make sure you identify all those particular places there on your left-hand side and answer some of the questions that are there. All you have to do for the left-hand side in answering the essential questions is complete your snap chart. Make sure that you're ready for any kind of quiz on this and have a good day. Make the hay.